Hey everyone, it's Travis, your GM and Sinister Torture, I mean Storyteller. We're back into the full swing of storytelling, finally caught up on all of the creative things that we've been doing here at Fool and Scholar Productions. What sort of things? Well, for one, we're recording an orchestra in about two weeks that will lead to about 16 minutes of new music for our shows. This gives us everything we need to close out the first story arc of Dark Dice, and it's been quite a lot of work to put together over the last few months. On top of the charity event, where you helped us raise over $10,000 for the Trepper Project, and the release of Domain of the Nameless God on the DMs Guild. That's right, our adventure, the one you've been listening to, is now available to play at your home. Domain of the Nameless God is already an Electrum bestseller, soon to be gold bestseller, and if you already have a copy from our Patreon or from Purchase, we'd greatly appreciate you writing a review to accompany your 5-star rating. Every single review truly helps smaller titles like ours get visibility and creep into the feeds of the unsuspecting. But enough from me, let's get into the story. Do you seek him? You have found yourself among those who roll the dark dice. What you are about to hear happened long ago, a story brought back from the edge of oblivion, dutifully transcribed and enhanced orally to better captivate your attention. Previously, the team set off for Milmeter's Hope to find the town's missing children. Instead, something else found them. Now down another of their number, can they endure the trials to come? Will the team's resolve hold up? Will odds roll in their favor? Fear the strangers in your midst. Never play games of fate. Lark God! Dark Dice, Chapter 13, Silent Faith. The team had concluded a brief funeral in the shadow of the Great Archway. It was a simple old bare arch and if it once boasted ruins on its worn surface, they had now long since eroded. Is there any way to go past this archway without going through it? Well, we could leave the path and try to go around. Not gonna happen. I pick up my stuff and I just walk through. As the team followed close behind and stood mere feet from the archway, they felt an inherent connection to it, a sort of strange familiarity and significance, as though they had been here before, perhaps in a dream. The last to walk through, the ranger, Soren Arkwright, could see his fellows on the other side move slowly, as if underwater or under a spell. Carefully stepping around them, until, as he passed through the archway, the spell seemed broken and everything returned to its normal pace. Mere seconds later, a gentle gust of wind whistled by and the trees themselves shifted slightly from deep oranges and yellows to browns and greens again. The sensation put them oddly at peace. Did... It just changed from spring. Yeah, but considering the things that have been happening of late, I'm rather okay with that. You said it felt like I was in a dream that I've been here before? Possibly. I'm I'm getting that feeling as well. Any way of recalling that dream? Rowena needed to roll an unmodified luck check. Alright. Twelve. Rowena was able to recall her dream from the previous night's rest. And the dream is... Oh, I was just thinking. I, uh, I got my hammer and pitons and everything. We could maybe have climbed over, but... Possibly made sure that time didn't go quicker. I don't think it works that way. <laughs> if I dream about losing money to Ice, I've lived that. I don't need to dream it. Rowena suddenly had flashes of Renex, a smiling, healthy dwarf and her former lover, living a pleasant life with his wife and children. <laughs> in the dream, Renex was with his two children, who each bore a strong resemblance to him in a large yard. As the nightmare continued, he helped his wife in the kitchen. She lovingly watched as he put the children to sleep and they began to kiss in their bedroom and passionately copulate. Afterward, they fell asleep, naked, happy to be in love. This image was more torture to Rowena than any of her recent trials, being forced to watch the man she loved with his wife and happy children, living the life she wanted. Rowena was then reminded of exactly where she was, and sadly, she was unable to recall the events of the dream that were particular to this location. I'm on the other side, feeling like worse crap. Excellent. Would we like to continue down the road? Is it still just the one path, nothing else? Still just the one path for now, hey. Eh? The team walked for three hours until they reached a crossroad. A single split, each trailing off in a slightly different direction until passing beyond view. 
Was this on the map? I remember seeing a couple of splits on the road, yeah, but we'd have to check the map to confirm it exactly, which none of us really want to do. <laughs> it only looked like one main road though, and then a couple of really small offshoots from what I remember. It wasn't like, you know, a big split and two large roads, but thankfully one of the roads ahead is more prominent than the other at least. Is it the one that goes to the castle? I didn't see a castle ahead because both roads bend and ebb through a fucking forest. The one veering off to the right gets a little bit, um... It's a thinner road, and it doesn't appear to have to be trodden as much, and it appears to be just dirt as opposed to compacted dirt from wear and use. Is there anyone that could maybe have a decent look at the ground to see if anyone is, um, you know, if any small footprints have passed that way? I can try it with a 20. I do see uh, recent footsteps on the wider path to the left, I believe. Good enough for me. Sir, do you want to take the front and maybe follow the tracks maybe see if they veer off or if they slow down or stop at all that would be helpful for us to know if they are moving slower than we absolutely i will keep an eye on them here thank you an hour of silent travel passed boots passing over the packed dirt and fallen leaves of the path and after that hour the landscape began to change within five minutes the air grew warmer and more moist the surroundings gradually taking on the feel of a swamp more than a forest. Then unexpectedly the path led directly into a thick liquid, as clear as water, though dense as mud. Beneath the crystal clear thick liquid, footsteps were plainly visible, almost as if captured in the liquid, preserved just moments ago. The visibility into the liquid remained clear, even as the path descended further beneath it to a depth of roughly two feet. I'd like to try skimming a stone across this. Rowena succeeded in skimming a stone across the liquid surface, skipping five times before splashing and sinking, the bubbles escaping beneath it as it landed harmlessly on the path. Doesn't look like it uh, dissolved or anything. I don't know what this liquid is. I don't know it from my travels, but I would like to do a little test. I want to walk up to where the, uh, the viscous liquid starts, and I want to push my finger into it and see if I sink by pushing on it. Yes, it appeared to be just like mud but as clear as water. So, uh, it appears to be just mud or uh, syrup, but clear as water. And when I pulled my finger out, it just had a little bit of resistance. Soren, can you tell if the feet were moving fast when they passed in this area? Let me check if there's anything I can discern from the footsteps with a 22. Well, look at me rolling well today. <clears throat> I mean, uh, it uh, looks like whoever was walking through here was very tired. Looks like they were able to make it through. It didn't slow them too badly. I agree with your assessment. Just like mud. All right. I was assuming it was some kind of a trap. Maybe if you stopped, it would swallow you whole. Uh, maybe not. I suppose we can't go off the path to get any trees to hold on to, so, um, who's going first? I'll go I'll for go. it. We'll both go. Slowly, cautiously, Rowena and Soren took steps into the liquid confirming their hypothesis. The steps started slowly. After they waited a few moments, they confirmed that they were indeed safe, and the other two joined them and continued to follow the path. It was a slow-moving journey, and lacking waterproof boots, it only took a few minutes for their feet to chafe, ache, and hurt. The pain from walking was not inconsistent with their situation, so there was no cause for discussion or alarm, yet this was only one of the many inconveniences that assaulted them over the next four hours. Thankfully, there was no difficulty following the footsteps, even as they reached another split in the road, as the footfalls clearly favored the left path. The right path was untrod, and off the path, further to the right, could be discerned the faint echoing of chimes off in the distance. Another split, though the direction we need to travel is plain, even to me, so why have we stopped? Well, two things. It may be worth noting that even though we are following the group that has the children, the gentleman without legs did say they've been wandering around here for a very long time. Though we are following them, they might not be on the right path to whatever their destination is. That's a good point. You have a very good point. Does either path take us away from the viscous liquid? It's basically a swamp at this point. And no end in sight? Not either path as far as I see, nope. As soon as we're out of this liquid, I would love to check the map again. You said there was a second reason why we stopped. Yeah, the chimes. Can you hear them? I don't think Stop I... Stop moving your chainmail and try to listen. It's that way. Oh, I hear it now. 
What do you suppose it is? Rowena, is there any pattern to the chimes? Does it seem like just wind chimes? Or is it a melody of some sort? It doesn't feel melodic. It, it kind of like when you've got a glass and you put your finger over it, if it's slightly wet and you get that resonation. But it's just one resonation. It's very clearly, fairly consistent, but not... It's, it's clear, it's just not melodic. It's... I don't know. And then there's a couple more faint ones that pitter afterwards. And then it starts up again a few seconds later. It's regular. It'd be a shitty musician if it was intentional. Maybe some kind of natural sound here. So we got their tracks right. We're following the kids' tracks. It's not that old of an attract. Can you tell to make sure it's still them? They all look fairly fresh to me. I'm not able to tell. Thing is, we can either go chase those chimes and kind of maybe go off the path and have to start again all the way back there, or we keep following the tracks where we definitely know they were. Rowena, please hand me the map. I am going to make sure. I, I think Soren made a very good point. We are going for the castle, and the children probably don't know where they are going. No, but we are following the tracks, right? And I'll, I'll pass in the map. Thank you. Uh, I'm assuming sanity check, because I am checking out the map. Looking at the dizzying images of the map would require a sanity saving throw. Right, that's uh, 21. Father Westpike had become somewhat accustomed to the shifting lines of the map. He was not sure if this level of familiarity should upset or please him as he pondered this while he examined its images. I am checking the map, and I'm, I'm making the assumption that we went the main path of the fork that we didn't look at the map. And I'm looking this area up. Okay, this path that we're on, the one that appears to be the one that the footsteps follow in favor, seems to be the one towards the castle. Uh, have you got any idea of what, um, what happens with the other one? The other one leads literally into the woods, as if it's like a cave or a canopy. An enclosed canopy of space. Super dense wood. And I can't follow it after a certain period of time. There are a number of places that very well could emerge from. The map tells us tells us we should follow the steps to get to the castle and the the offshoot. I fear that if we try to follow it, we may find ourselves stuck in a loop. Maybe have to go back to the beginning, to the tree. We definitely can't afford that at this point. No, no. We must soldier up. Although what happens? You say it goes into... it goes nowhere? Somewhere? Nowhere? It goes into something that looks like a drawing of a cave or a tunnel of tree color. And, and, and the track itself does not show where it goes from there. But there are other cave openings randomly strewn about the map. Yeah, are there any caves closer to the castle? Let me check. There are like four or five different types of caves that are fairly close to the castle. The marks look similar for one of them, so the path to the right enters into the area of the woods. If you can think of a, like a subterranean system of a very dense foliage that the map does not show, it's more like that now that I'm looking at it again, and the map shows where all the entrances to the dense forests are, the canopy is connected to a continuous forest piece that does lead technically to where we want to go, but I do not see an exit on the other side close to the castle. We could possibly use the sidetrack to cut through the forest, maybe get to the castle faster, maybe slower. I don't know, but we are risking the chill... We are taking the risk of getting lost in the forest because the map will not lead us in there. How long's the path of the castle compared with what we've already done? We're about a third of the way there. It's not a straight path, it bends quite a few ways. But it's generally... The future is sort of an S. A series of S to get there. Are the archways marked on the map? At the risk of pissing off the DM by abusing an amazing sanity roll from earlier, I can see the first archway we passed through. And sure enough, there appear to be two more. I do not see any archways in the forest, which would mean a massive time win for us. This is a gamble. You realize that, Dias. I know. I know, but at this point we've already lost two of our party, so why not? There's a saying from where I'm from. Go big or go home. Yeah, same from where I'm from as well. You're gonna have worse. You can always get worse. Rowena, Soren, are you okay with trying to go through the forest? Just to clarify, we can either go through the forest, which might exit near the castle, or through the swamp. And there were archways in the swamp, but not in the forest? There's the main road that we have been following, and it has archways on it up ahead. Or there's the thick forest, which kind of closes itself off, and we don't have a map for that. And there's potentially no archways there. Did I explain that sufficiently? I say we go for the shortcut. I know it's a gamble, but I'm a gambling man. So there is what we're up against is the possibility that if we choose the path through the forest, the shortcut, we might end up back uh, a day ago at the hanging I've tree. I've got an idea. 
why don't I go? I should test it. Because if I disappear, you can keep going. The assumption is not that we will be teleported like we were when we entered the forest. The assumption is that we will get lost, and by turning around, we will be teleported to the forest. Uh, to the tree, I think. Either way, Ayas, you can't be at the front of this anymore. It's right. your kids. If we fuck up, we need to be the ones at the front to take that fall. Because if we take a path and it's wrong, and we have to turn back, you can probably find another way by forging a different way. You shouldn't be in the lead at all. Thank you. I... I appreciate that. This is your decision, so if we're going for the forest, let's do it now. We could gain a lot of time, so let's do it. It's... it's worth it. Okay. The discussion ended, and the team watched as Rowena led them down the right path for ten paces ahead. They traveled like this for twenty minutes in silence, the swamp gradually reaching a sort of shore at the edge of the promised forest. Rowena, first to reach the edge, realized just how dense and very dark the woods ahead were. They seemed somehow colder, even just two paces in, and she came to quickly miss the perpetual twilight overhead, its aurora dancing and the lights in the sky shifting, as they had now been replaced with total darkness. Unfortunately, one among the party did not have low-light vision. I do have a lantern and some candles if anyone wants them. Oh, bollocks. My blue candle seems to have vanished and my lantern seems to have cracked, probably from the fight. But I'm just assuming I'll light the lantern at this point, as I'm sick of fumbling around by this point, and I can't be bothered to find my torch. I think I just, uh, like, I have, like, both the dwarves have low light vision. Dark vision, sorry. Oh, yeah. I do as well. Yeah, you're a tiefling, right? It's just the human. So you're holding the torchlight for Soren's sake? Yep. Stupid humans. Ah, good for you. Here, Soren. He's got a point. Here's the lantern. Soren was given the cracked, mundane lantern. Finally, a lantern I can use. As the team continued on their path, and within a few minutes of their track into the woods, a thick, viscous orange sap began to fall, almost like rain. The storm grew in intensity as the heavy, sticky rivulets that stung ever so slightly frosted immediately on contact with skin and armor. But the team had little time to process this phenomenon, for by the time they drew their cloaks, raised shields, and found cover under roots, the phenomenon began to subside almost as quickly as it arrived, leaving with them foul stench of rot. Well, fuck. Don't worry about it. I'll cast pre-devastation to clean us all off. It'll take a few minutes, but you know, hold still. Thanks. Rowena spent the next five minutes cleaning off the team and their gear, carefully clearing every bit of sap from them before they were ready to move on. But before they could continue, Soren was the only one to notice glowing eyes in the shadows belonging to five humanoid figures, garbed in wood, animal hides, and bone, silently stepping forward, whispering a phrase over and over again. Before the chanting voices caught the attention of the others, Soren threw his leg toward the figures while notching an arrow on his bow. The figures had gray ashen skin and were garbed in a mix of animal hides, wooden cloth. The eyes of the two unmasked figures glowed with a hellish red, while the others' eyes were not visible behind their distorted masks. Most disturbing, however, was their leader, a tall, gaunt figure wearing nothing but the skull of a unicorn and a tattered cloak seemingly stirring with a life of its own, stitched together from pale, elven flesh. We're under attack! Five total! Unicorn's the leader! And I'm gonna shoot that unicorn right in the face, best I can. Though masculine, the body was emaciated, lacking defined features, and as it crept forward with an unnatural gait, three glowing orbs from beneath the unicorn's skull at war give the distinct impression that the skull was laughing, while also suggesting the wearer's true identity. Eighteen to hit, eight damage. Soren's aim rang true, and even as the creature moved to dodge out of the way, the arrow caught it in the shoulder with an audible crack. The creature began to move in a shifting, twitching rhythm as one of their number, a misshapen figure buried beneath a swath of furs, held up two scythes, both visibly dripping with blood as the scythes lacked handles and clearly dug into the user's hands, indicating the source of the crimson. And in a series of swift motions, ashen skin became visible beneath the fur hood, and red eyes glowed from beneath the bear skull as it began to chant an old draconic, slowly bringing the blades down in a strange pattern. The scythe seemed to carve into the very air itself, opening a rift of sorts and ushering in a dense fog. The air on everyone's skin rose as the team began to feel the weight of the fog squeeze their lungs, seizing them as though the air itself were water and they were now drowning. Now, those of us unclear with the rules of drowning, the team had a bit of time. It was okay for now, but the countdown on each character was based on their constitution, which dictated how many rounds they'd be able to breathe. Number of con rounds, right? Yeah, the big number, not the little one. That's yep. the important differentiator. Sweet. Okay, back to the fight. The second figure, a wide humanoid male with a mask of thin bark, rushed toward the closest thing he could reach. Rowena. 
Her normal reflexes were temporarily distracted as she saw the antlers he held in each of his bloodied hands had been sharpened, edged, and were not in fact being held, but rather pierced through his mangled hands and wrists and sealed to become part of his body through magics. The figure caught Rowena across the side for five days, and she was also required to make a constitution saving throw. Of what? What the fuck? Ah! 22. Rowena didn't care. She was good. Very good. I know. It's great. <laughs> An athletically thin female wearing a mask made from the skull of a deer moved to engage Father Westpike. The mangled ruination of bone and metal filled the absence of her right arm, which was missing from the elbow down. The weapon, seemingly formed from part of her bone, struck at Father Westpike, who was able to pull a shield up just in time to block the reckless assault of strikes that followed. A smaller figure with a featureless wooden mask was next. Her very hands ending in massive, unnatural talons, her body warped and stretched around the neck, biceps, and ankles. She hit Soren from the side, clawing at his left arm for seven damage. Failing his constitution saving throw, Soren's wounds were not curable, reducing his maximum hit points. Alright, Father Westpike moves very far forward so that he's blocking or in the way like... I'm basically trying to put myself between the party and the monsters. He also raises his hammer to the sky and blesses the three of you. The three of us? You're the only ones left. Hashtag blessed. I just need one more person to die and then I can bless myself every time. That was oddly grim. Father Westpike raised his hammer to the canopy above, and three beams of light pierced the darkness, engulfing his allies, the targets of the spell, almost like motes of dust in the air. The light quickly coalesced around their heads into halos. I move up to my cousin, and I'm going to pull up my harp. You might be strong, you might even be brave, but you're not going to outlive this thunder wave. I'm going to strum down on the harp right next to my cuz, and I'm going to cast thunder wave at level three, and I'm going to hit every single one of them in front of us, the 15 damage. The deafening sound was accompanied by a crash of energy. And while the figure with the bear furs and the deer skull figure were hit hard enough to be knocked back 10 feet, the others remained firm footed and eager to get revenge. I use my bonus action to turn and look back at Ice and I say, You can stop, you can drop, you can roll over your life. I'm going to give you control and I'll give him bardic inspiration. Crossbow time. I hope you're the silent one under there. 20 to hit, 23 damage thanks to bardic inspiration and sneak attack. Distracted by the thunderous clash, the silent one could not see Ayas' shot until it was too late, catching the creature onto the mask, very nearly missing one of its glowing eyes. It shrieked in disgust and rage, its long talons raking and eroding his flesh for twelve ah! damage, slashing the face, shoulder, and side, while the shroud on its back flexed and battered Father Westpike for five bludgeoning damage. So, assuming I might have time to ask myself, uh, if our friend, the bear skull there, dies, we no longer run the risk of drowning, right? It would really seem that way, Soren. Well, okay, Sindri blessed this shot, so here goes. <laughs> Natural 20 to hit, and uh, 7 plus... Setting to the familiar work of killing monsters, Soren took aim just under the bear's snout and let loose the arrow. It pierced the flesh beneath, boring straight into the center of the skull, dropping the creature hard. As a small grin crossed Soren's face, from his shadow emerged a black figure, roughly the shape and build of a humanoid, seemingly identical to Soren. As it rose to meet him, its features bubbling, hissing skin that dripped ooze, whispered in a dozen different voices that escaped its drooping mouth, and Soren recognized one of the voices to be his own. Soren required a wisdom saving throw as the voice commanded him in the Fourteen. Soren overcame his battle of wits as a separate figure emerged from the shadow of Ias. Similarly identical, except for the hissing, crackling, and melting skin. Faint whispers of agony escaped its mouth, visibly lined with a perfect set of pearlescent teeth, requiring Ias to make a similar wisdom signal for him. Sixteen. <sighs> okay. As the creature with the bear skull fell, all at once the sensation of being underwater ended and the mist retreated. As the creature with mangled hands slashed its edged antlers out, fighting with the Sindri's exposed flesh at the point where the ooze had left a hole in his armor. But due to the hardy dwarf's constitution, the wound would surely heal. The final two creatures sought retaliation against Rowena, the deer skull woman redirecting her flurry of blows towards Rowena effectively, but distracting the dwarf as the talons from the final creature slashed her exposed back for four damage, which also would heal thanks to Rowena's constitution. So there are two shadowy figures attacking our buddies in the back room now. Yeah, well, more like sort of just hissing at us, but yeah. All right. Keep these things engaged. By Pellor's light, protect my cousin with a warding bond. I'm gonna go help them. No, not do what you're doing. I will totally forego doing anything to stop him from moving right now. I can't believe you're that stupid. Father Westpike was swiftly struck in the back of the head <clears throat> with a hand harp. Fucking idiot, stop it! Father Westpike took the hint, turned around, and glared menacingly at the creatures attacking his cousin. 
your lives don't matter. I'm casting Shatter. Uh, cause fuck it. Uh, 21 damage on a failed save. With the strum of her hand harp. The reverberation created a burst of sound and energy that resonated with the bones of the deer skull woman, causing her to shatter outward in an explosion of gore and simply no longer be. At the moment, I don't know what is wrong and what is right. As long as you're next to me, I guess I will fight. Thank you. You're welcome. You're inspired. Speaking which, Ice, you're up. Ice took aim at the creature with the mask of bark. We hate you. Please die. 19 to hit, 13 damage. The crossbow bolt shattered the bark of the mask, sending the exploding splinters to embed into the face beneath. A painful death, the creature writhed and screamed as it tried to scratch its face with its mangled hands of iron and bone. As Mir paces away, Soren thought of his lucky dagger, which now found its way into his hand as he took a stab at his shadow. Shing, shing, that's a uh, 17 to hit. With 11 damage, Soren plunged his murderous dagger into the heart or whatever it was that was in the place of that creature, and the entire shadow structure dissolved into a crimson bone and bubbling shadow. But something was wrong, and Soren found himself also taking 11 damage, as a nearly identical wound opened on his chest, missing his heart and not piercing quite as deeply, his real shadow visible beneath his feet thanks to the light of the throne lantern. Soren watched as the two standing figures slashed wildly at Father Westpike and Rowena, who both successfully dodged and blocked the incoming blows. A loud shriek pierced the din, but Father Westpike resisted its call. As closer to Soren, Aias dodged the attacks from his shadow, his pitted rapier now out and at the ready. Realizing the ebb and flow of battle had turned against it, the silent one fled, dodging Rowena's attack and subsequent spell as it ran off into the darkness beyond the light of the lamp. Thanks, the silent one's running. Uh, uh, stay here. Uh, Rowena's gonna get a better view of him and say, You can run, you can hide, but you I will always find, and I'll cast whole person on. With very lucky roll, with iron will, I mean, the silent one continued its departure, jumping over a fallen log, vanishing entirely as Father Westpike raised a hammer above his head and spoke the holy word of Pelor. A blinding radiant light came down from above, piercing through the darkness, punching a hole clear through the talent creature, disintegrating it. So, yeah, I'm going to attack with my dagger, because seeing what happened to Sauron, I know that I'm going to take damage. Uh, unless there's anything else I could possibly use to stop this thing, but I can't imagine that there is. Oh, you'll be fine. Just look at me. Anyone else got any ideas? Just stab him up. You're fully healed, dude. You're fine. Uh, that, that's true. Okay, yeah, I'm going to hit with my dagger. Natural 20. Double damage. So... Fuck. I hit it too hard. Maya stabbed into the creature, aiming for its shoulder. Fortune favored his strike, and it landed the blow across its neck, decapitating the shadow, which swiftly evaporated. Ias was less than pleased, however, to receive a similar, but less than lethal cut across the front of his own neck. The team was then left to themselves in the silent darkness of the forest with a few corpses and the light of the cracked lantern. We've had worse. Aye. I want to walk and pick up any of the masks that survive. That is not the disgusting Talon mask and inspect it. Hmm. Tree bark. Little loop on the back sort of fitted, but it does not seem magical. Okay, now that we're out of the battle, quick inventory check. How badly hurt are people? Uh, severely. Enough for a rest. I suggest we just take a short rest and people will naturally heal up, and if I sing a little song, you'll feel a bit better too. That's true, that's true. Don't waste your magics. I'm pretty low myself, so just try and conserve what we can. Alright, a quick rest, but no letting me nap or I'll be grumpy when I wake up. I mean, we only need like an hour, just read a prayer or something. I support this decision, Rowena. I think we should take a short rest. Okay, so breaking the immersion for a second to explain how this works. The team took a few paces away from their battle site and sat down to relax. This does not mean they required sleep, just to be relaxing and not engaging in strenuous activities. They each had a limited pool of dice called hit dice, which they could use during their short rest to heal themselves, aided by Rowena's magical abilities. As level 4 heroes, they each had 4 hit dice, and they could roll that dice to recover health. The hit dice they spent were recovered after each long rest. As the group would be still fairly awake and aware, and not likely to have any real risk of too many horrible things happening, that's why I'm giving a dry explanation, and why I think it would be unfair in this instance to pull any real dickery. Because I'm pulling out my harp and I'm going to be singing a song of rest, something, I don't know, pretty or miserable, something to fit with the moment, um, and for every hit dice you roll, you get to roll an extra d6. It's something like that, anyway. Nice. The team took a quick one-hour break by the light of the battered lantern, drying their feet and shoes, nursing their wounds, which were sealed magically by the enchantments in Rowena's music. It had been nine hours since their long rest, beyond the gentle strumming of the hand harp, 
team was mostly silent, with Ias and Father Westpike both looking over the remains of the creatures that had attacked them. They were mostly naked, save for furs and those masks which were made of mostly wood or bone. I was hoping for food, I'll admit. No, their skin is really weird. It's like, sort of like how drow skin is supposed to be, but this is more of like a chalky colour. I'm gonna draw a line in the sand. We're not eating them. I, I, I never said out loud that we were gonna do it. I know you. Line in the sand. We are not eating them. Good luck, good luck. Okay, I feel rested and there's nothing of value on these things. Are we good to go now? Yes. And so the team continued down the path toward the domain of the Nameless God. Dark Dice, Chapter 13, The Silent Faithful. Starring David Alt as Ayas Inskeep, Peter Lewis as Soren Arkwright, Vitor Vithyarsson as Father Sindri Westpike, Cassie Rilinicki as Filgia the Witch, Hem Cleveland as Lady Rowena Granite Pike, and Travis Van Groff as Dungeon Master, with transcriptions by Hem Cleveland. This episode was co-edited by Sarah Baczynski and Marissa Ewing of Hemlock Creek Productions. Produced with sound design by Travis Van Groff, with mixing and mastering by Hemlock Creek Productions. This episode featured music by Travis Van Groff, Sam Bose Miller, Stephen Malin, and Fui Madain. To support this presentation and get access to bonus releases, music, and an early copy of the adventure, including transcriptions, artwork, and more, please join our Patreon at patreon.com slash libertypodcast. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook at Dark Dice Pod. This is a Fool and Scholar production. Thank you for listening.